Right, so we did trees in, in the last class, and then basically this slide sort of summarizes what a tree is. During training, you just essentially you pick a very simple split, very simple classifier, which could be just one of these vertical split. Uh, for example, the dashed black line here is one split. And then you count how many points of each class fall on each side. And these are the points that fall on top. These are the counts for the points that are on top of the dashed line. These are the counts for the points that are below um, the dashed line. And, um, and that's it. So you're splitting the training data. Like, like, like we did for the tree well, when we had customers, you're just splitting into the, the how many customers left, how many stayed, to this step. You build your tree, the way you choose, and then the way you choose between these different vertical bars is just by maximizing information gain, which all of you should know how to compute information gain because that's in the final. So, um, uh, and once you know how to compute information gain, um, then this is just a binary decision. So at test time, when a, when a point comes into a node, you check whether the point is on top of the line or below the line. If it's on top of the line, you send it right, otherwise you send it left. And so trees are very simple decisions, just like very you know, just like vertical horizontal lines on your data should be enough, the vertical, you know, axis of line planes should be enough to separate your data. Um, of course, a single tree is a rough uh, way of splitting the data. And so we mentioned that a better way of doing this is combining many trees, averaging trees. And so when we average trees, um, uh, what, what we do is we train each tree on a subsample of the data, or you could train each tree on the full data set. Some people do that too. The Microsoft guys actually, uh, as we will see, um, it depends on what kind of effect you want, and it depends on your constraints. If you have a massive data set, loading data into RAM these days is just becomes prohibitively expensive. I mean, we can use flash RAM and so all the solid state RAM, all you know, the sort of the latest. Um, in, in technology in terms of RAM, but still there's bottlenecks. Typically you, work, you will work with data sets that cannot be loaded into memory. Those are the interesting, the, some of the interesting data sets, those are the sort of big data sets that people care about. Um, credit card transactions, all sorts of customer data, um, environmental data, medical record, etc. Um, but you can load part of the data into uh, the RAM of a single machine and a different part of the data into the RAM um, of another machine. The data records, the data can be overlapping, so you could have one customer actually loaded into two machines. Um, that doesn't matter. Um, each tree learns from a subset of the data. That's called bagging. If you use the full data set and you can actually get confidence estimates, and that's called bootstrapping. I, I haven't covered bootstrapping, I will do bootstrapping in 540. Um, but right now, it also will give you the theory behind this, why this works well, you know, in more principle. Um, right now, it's we're being practical. Each tree learns from a little bit of data. Uh, moreover, each for each tree, we don't consider all the possible features. We only consider a subset of the features. So we randomize the data. So each tree only sees a little bit of the data. And moreover, um, each tree only has a subset of the features. So like, for example, in building a text classifier, like for Twitter, if you were to build a random forest for your exercise, for your homework, then one tree would only lo look at, pick, say, 100 out of all your, was it 10,000 features? Yeah. So it would take 100 of 10,000 and would only search over, it would enumerate over those 100, so it would go one by one and would test for each which one has the highest information gain. And then it would pick one. So you don't search over 10,000, but you, uh, you only search over 100. So you're randomizing, you're picking a hundred, 
And the reason is we're creating trees that are very different. And each of these trees might not be the greatest uh, classifier, but when you average many trees, um, you get a very strong classifier. And by averaging trees, um, we went over this uh, as well in the last class. That means that at the test time, you have a new input, V. Um, for that input, you, you, every time you reach a node, you basically check, is it to the right of the threshold or to the left? And based on the threshold, you set the, the V left or right until it reaches a leaf. Now, from the training data, each leaf has associated with it a histogram, like what those four colors are for. In this case, we're classifying into four classes. And so, the four histograms, as the point reaches each of the leaves, um, sorry, the three histograms are those three that I'm showing you there, that's the probability of each class. We normalize the histogram so that um, the four colors add up to one. And then all we do is we just add up, we just add those three things and normalize. So it's just an average of three histograms. That still gives you a histogram, and that's your final classifier. Those, those are your final classes when you average them. So as you can see, for example, here, the first tree and the second tree, the first tree and the second tree are fairly confident that the point should be green. They believe V is a green guy. The last tree believes V is green, but is not very sure. It could equally well be, so almost equally well be red or blue. But when you sum them all up, um, the point will be prevalently green. And so green will, because two out of three guys strongly think it's green. So averaging will um, give you the right classification. So even if one tree is not very good, it's in fact sort of will be. Is it always averaging, or is there ever some other function that we use? Very, very good question. So there are different ways you could average. There's this. This is the arithmetic average. Um, the dropout nets they use geometric averaging, so products. So there's a sort of product averaging, and then some people combine using meta level. Uh, information and that leads to other techniques called um, stacking and in fact there is a competition in Wikipedia um, called um, what's it called the Hutter Prize so the Hutter Prize is will be given to whoever can compress Wikipedia the most um, and uh, lossless compression um, it, because the Hutter thinks that uh, compression and intelligence are very interlinked. So if you want to build an intelligent machine, you should be able to build a machine that's capable of compressing data. Um, the entry that's winning right now, it's called PAQ, and it uses a, um, exactly a way of averaging where it's based on context. How, it, In order to sort of predict what words, what words will appear next, to a word, it uses the context of the words. So it has a very fancy averaging. And, and it's really nice, because you can type a few words with that technique, and it's so predictive that it can then continue writing a whole paragraph, and you read it, and it's actual English. <laughs> it makes sense. So if you want to see some demos of that technique, go to my webpage. I have a paper called PAQ um, this year. and you'll see that it's synthesized. Uh, the technique is amazing. It really, it's scary almost how well it predicts. Is there a notion of like a confidence interval or some confidence predictions and would we want to yes. give more weight to things that are yeah. maybe more confident? So the confidence intervals, especially if you take, especially if you sample, if you have a data set of n points and you sample n points from a data set of n points, mm -hmm. Um, you can actually get very good confidence um, intervals with very strong theoretical properties. That's good strapping. And sometimes we want to know, we only, so especially if you have few data, you have, because sometimes, you know, there's all, everyone talks about big data, 
But you're running an experiment, you're doing a drug trial, which is again another place where there's a lot of machine learning. Um, you might only want to give this drug to 10 patients with cancer because, you know, a few of them die in the process of you testing a drug. So getting data there is really expensive. So you only end up with a few data. And if you only have a few data, you want to know, are my estimates good enough based on this amount of data? And bootstrapping is a technique that allows you to assess that. All right. The rest is basically, uh, how does this behave? So here is a data set with two classes. Um, so the input is two-dimensional, uh, coordinate x1, coordinate x2. So say height and weight of a person. Um, and then there's two trees there on top. So um, this is my first tree. This tree puts a decision boundary here. And this other tree puts a decision boundary here. If I only use one tree, my decision boundary could be something like this. So one class is red, one class is blue. But if I use eight trees, I start getting also shaded sort of comfort. So I, I know I get better estimates of the probability that you class yellow or class red. And as you go for more trees, as you can see, you start getting a really nice estimate of the probability of points being either red or yellow. So for any point there, the color intensity, you know, how yellow it is or how red would tell you the, the probability of the point being yellow or red. So a single tree is just a binary decision, but when you start averaging, you essentially get a very nice decision surface. So you could have a very nice decision surface going through these points. Um, what else is important? Um, so, oh, if you have more classes, random forest, whether you have two classes, or uh, two classes, or four, or is that four? Yeah, four classes that work pretty well, as you can see, even if you have data like this, like the spiral data. If there is noise, it doesn't work as well, but it's still quite reasonable. It's not too bad. Uh, here is an example of what happens when, so one of the big questions here is um, how big is the trees? How, how deep should the trees be? We want them to be balanced, but how far should they go? And this has been a big question in research, and especially in the late 90s, early 2000s was a huge question. Um, um, here are some results that give you this, the story. If, you, if your trees are too small, you might have some underfitting in that you don't get particularly you could still get some of these points being red for example so you're being a bit conservative um, if you use trees that are too deep so the trees start becoming complex then you start seeing this oscillation okay, so it's the same as with neural networks and with uh, RBFs if your model has too many parameters, it has the ability of overfit. So there is some sweet spot there. How do we find it? Cross validate. In 540, I teach you how to do this automatically. One last thing about trees. By the way, Scikit, Scikit-Learn, which I've advertised in the Google group, has decision trees, has random forests, so the code is there for you. Uh, Weka, uh, a Java tool, also has a pretty good code for random forests. Um, but whether you do bagging and the depth of the tree, all of these variables are parameters in the code to the trees. So I hope you understand what each of these variables does when you, when you get to go and run the code. Bagging. So the previous results all were based on each classifier looks at all the data. Um, but uh, here we, I'm going to compare two things. On top, each, each tree looks at all the data. So the only randomization is only of the features. 
Um, the, the bottom plot, the randomization is also over date. So each tree only looks at 50% of the date. So the tree, each tree is looking at less data. Uh, what do we observe? A few important things that in 548 make more precise. Um, first, the points that are closest to the boundary, the points of both classes that are closest to each other, they seem to be the ones that matter the most. And what we actually find, if you just do the naive random forests, is that this, these distances from the decision boundary that random forest finds, which is this, to where the points are, is the, are the same. This is called a max margin property. And it's the, the, the key idea that is used in order to build things called support vector machines. So support vector machines, um, if you have many points that you're trying to classify, um, if you want to even if you want to use a linear classifier, there's many lines you could draw that separate these points, right? But some lines will be more robust than others. Um, what support vector machine tells you, what the max margin principle tells you, is you look at the points in the boundary, and then you draw the line that tries to maximize the gap between the points in the boundary, that tries to maximize this gap. This gap is called the margin. And these points in the boundary, they're called the support vectors. And the name support vectors comes from the fact that these are vectors, points are vectors, and then there's support because they provide support for the decision boundary. So random forest happens to have that property naturally. And one more add for 540, we proved this there. It's proven also in the paper by uh, uh, Tony Criminisi. So if you go, if you Google Decision Forest 2011 or Criminisi 2011, you will get the Microsoft technical report from where I got these plots. It's a beautiful, beautiful description of Decision Forest. I couldn't teach it better than they have that. So I strongly recommend you read that if you're interested in more learning more about it. 150 pages. <laughs> Every page worth reading. <laughs> I have read each page and I did not, it was not one page I didn't like. <laughs> if you think that's uh, that's like, you can save it today for the final. When you, oh, I'm not asking you to do that for the final. I'll ask you to do it for you. If you ever need to go, if you ever want to go and work on machine learning or continue working on machine learning, that's the resource. Yeah. Uh, we only covered classification with random forest. So if you want to go and read this paper, you only need to read a chapter of classification, which is the first two chapters. You don't need to read everything else. I haven't used random forest for regression, but if you're interested, then you know by any means check out what they do. But we're not gonna. We're not covering that whole paper, we're only covering the first two sections. <coughs> okay, coming back to this. If you do bagging, we observe the following thing. The decision boundary moves. It moves to the left. It moves to be more in the middle of the two big clumps of points. It's not the max margin decision. Is this good or bad? It's good for avoiding outliers. It's good, yeah. Pardon? It's good if you have outliers, your boundary is sensitive to them. Exactly. If this, this guy, note that this guy is very far from its friends, it might be that that guy was just a mislabeling. It was a guy that wrote like, oh my god, I failed 540. Happy face. <laughs> and this was key. this. If you want to do better than what you did for your Twitter competition, and I think the folks last year did better than. Do you have? Well, I don't know if that was for last year anymore. 
But I think the guy that won the year actually did better. And he used, he, he took into account this, and he tried to account for the fact that there were lots of mislaid links. If you do that robust analysis, you can do a bit better. Because a lot of tweets are mislabeled. And that's very common. If you work with YouTube data, with any data, uh, you will have mislabeling. That's, that's the nature of the web. Okay, how do we build a face detector or a kitty detector or any detector for our objects in the world? You first take a huge data set. It's, you're never going to be able to call by, you're never going to be able to teach a machine what a face is by hand. Instead, you show it 5,000 faces. Then you Google objects or whatever word that you think will not return faces and that will give you another 9,400 non-face images. You, may, you might want to go through quickly over there make sure there's no faces. Once you have those um, images, then this is what you're going to do. You're going to take a very simple window and we're going to use windows that look like this, windows that look like this one, and then maybe, I think you only need ones that look like this. These windows will be of size 24 by 24 pixels. And then all you do is, let's say for, for example for this guy, you take the number, you, you sum the intensity of all the pixels that fall here, minus the intensity of the pixels that fall on the left and on the right. That's your feature. And, you can, and because you have many locations in the image where you could look, these features are also, um, these patches, there's an index eye that basically tells you in which location you're placing the patch. So in total, even though you only have these basic shapes, because you can change the location, you actually have about 180,000 possibilities. Possible features. That's the basic feature. Extremely simple features. They're just these little patches that just count how, what's intensity in the white minus the intensity on the black. And then you pick a bunch of thresholds, theta, and you just check is the intensity greater than the threshold. The intensities basically give you all those points in the plane that I have shown you. And now you're just comparing to a bunch of thresholds. So this is the weak learner. It's just a very basic decision. You take this feature, you put it in the image, you look at the difference between white and black, and then you check, is it greater than 0.2? If it is, left. If it's not, right. That's your basic note. Then you average all your weak learners. So, so basically we're using three, we will use trees here of only one node. So each tree in fact is a stem. It's just one node. A node that splits into two. There's many of these nodes, so you use, um, so you will search for which of the nodes is the one that splits, that gives you the better split, in terms of information gain as we've been doing before. And, and so for example, here is a good one, a good so here is a bad one, one that will give you low information gain. And that's it. That's how you build a feature. That's all there is to building face detect. It's just a simple decision tree. So you create a bunch of random thetas. So it's exactly... Those random thetas will give you these different levels. Each point is essentially an intensity value. The intensity of the patch or to be precise the difference of intensities and then you do for all of them but but again yeah, but you randomize to make it efficient so you subsample a few and then you check which one is the best one in terms of information gain and you pick that one and then you subsample the data and subsample parameters you keep doing that you produce a bunch of these randomized decision nodes, and then you average them all. And there's a face. A face is not made out of one thing, it's made out of 
thousands of little things that when you combine them, determine that what a face is. And that works beautifully. You can detect faces. Um, I've used it in sports events to detect hockey players so that the coaches can then know exactly whether the player was at any point in the game. So they can tell them. Um, it's the detectors that we use to build the cars that will drive by themselves that California has already legalized. And it's the detectors that you can use. Provided you have the data, like kitty faces, you can build a detector to do anything you want. Alright, uh, the last application that I want to cover is this, um, the Kinect. So, in the Kinect, um, there's a sensor in front of the TV that gives you a depth map. A depth map, it looks like this. It basically tells you how far is each point from the camera. So it's a, it's a depth, the camera is measuring the depth, so think of it as like a ray, like a bat. Um, robots will all, pretty much all robots these days have these sensors. They're actually quite cheap, like a hundred bucks, so mass produced. Um, the Kinect was the fastest sold, uh, fastest selling consumer electronic device uh, when it was launched. Because we're, we're looking at the, you know, record-breaking profits for Microsoft with the sense. Um, what Kinect wants to do is for each pixel, it wants to classify each pixel as being a body part, just like it's done here. Here's a prediction. So blue will be a hand, orange is say the head, uh, purple is this bit of the torso. And they want, for whatever the shape of a human in front, they want to classify it. Because if they know where your hands are, where your torso is, they can make sure that it's almost like you're immersed in the game. You don't need a Wii or anything. You can immerse yourself in the game. In order to get it to work, there's two clever ideas from um, Kinect. Um, the first idea is, well, we don't have enough labeled data. So if you wanted to produce the data, you would have to have an animator, basically a person. So first you put someone in front of a computer doing all sorts of things. You capture an image like this, and then you would have to have gone by hand. This is the head, this is the shoulder pixels, this is the arm, the other arm, this is the hand. And this would be extremely tedious for, for a human to do this for thousands or millions of images. Instead, what they did was the following. They used computer graphics, the inverse of vision. So, because you have models, what you do is you just deform these models. And for a computer graphics model, you know exactly where the shoulder is and the arms. So they actually generate the data synthetically. They just take a basic model and then they just apply a bunch of uh, transformations using standard computer graphics technology and now they have now they have in various because now it doesn't matter whether the players are short, tall, fat, thin, um, they can get all sorts of players, they can get a system that works for all sorts of players and they have data because you have a 3D model you can also get to depth the 3D model and then you train on the simulated data And when you train on the simulator data, you need very basic features. Um, the feature that they use for a pixel is extremely simple. They just have a pixel, let's say this pixel here. They essentially just look at two rays away from the pixel at random. And then they look at the difference in depth between those two points and the origin. So they essentially take the point x following the direction of the vector u, you normalize by how far that point x is from the camera, from the sensor. And that you have to do because you and I have something that's depth invariant. And then you have another point v, and then you look at the difference. That's the feature. And then the intuition is, if something is like, say, the belly, when you have these two vectors, the change in depth is not going to be big. But if you have something like the wrist, 
the change in depth tends to be larger <coughs> because often next to the rest, the thing that's next to the rest tends to be the other companies. Um, so basically the features in this case consist of the distance to the point and then the angle. So there's four parameters. And what they do is they just, well it's only four parameters, so what they do is they they generate a bunch of random values for these parameters. And then they build a tree. So you have random parameters and random thresholds. So they use, they just trace these and then they will check whether the change intensity is above a threshold, just like we do for the faces, where the, the difference between uh, the intensities of the two patches of pixels is above a certain threshold. And then they build a tree with this, and voila, you get connect, which allows you to. So they, they train this all offline, and then in real time, do they only do classification, or is it, does That's it also correct. learn in real time? Real time is just, it's just classification. classification. There's no additional learning in real time. Yeah. So, so machine learning tools like this are really nice because yeah. you, the training is very expensive, yeah. and it might take days or a week. But once you've trained that and you want to implement it on a chip, it's actually cheap because it's just feed forward classification on a chip. And that's what allows you to sell these devices so cheap. So, so really classification takes very little processing power, you really just Correct. Okay. And if you use random parameters as opposed to trying to learn these parameters, um, it makes it even cheaper. Uh, what would happen to their model if someone has a disability? Let's say he has only one leg or one arm or something like that. Don't ask me. You'd have to retrain the data, I guess. I, I don't know. I've never tested it with uh, someone with disability. Um, I've tested it with rats at the UBC lab here because I wanted to monitor rats uh, from which we, I was measuring brain waves. It didn't work too well, but the new generation of Kinect sensors that I think just came out now, or it's about to come, they will be much better. They, we can use them for animals and so on. I mean, this was trained for humans that are at a particular distance from TV and so on. If you want to do better, you... Uh, but I believe there will you know, this is my personal belief, there will be a generation of these sensors coming out to do all sorts of things. This is very hot new technology and we'll see a lot more of it. Each time they learn something new, like the developers, do they have to sell a whole new machine? Like each time they've retrained the model, or does it come out automatically with a version update? Or they will do whatever makes them the most money. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea what their strategy is, but knowing business people, that's what they do. Uh -huh. um, Using this model, how do they distinguish a right hand from a left hand, or is that knowledge given to it? They're able to do that. I think just from the differences, I guess because often the left hand is over here, I, I believe they, it actually differentiates the two. Um, I have, if you're interested in this and want to learn more about the Kinect or want to implement this, uh, one of my P, one of my master students is actually an expert on this. He he calls these things all the time. And he tries to do better than Microsoft. <laughs> it's not true. I, I was in that house. Oh, I'm not sure who's me, but um, it, did they collect data as as people play? Um, I don't know. I guess not. Collecting data would require putting extra material in the sensor. Uh, I don't know. That's, that's the best answer so I can offer you. I would be skeptic because you want the sensor to be as cheap as possible. You want to have cheap electronics and collecting data would mean a price to sensor. So I guess having real data isn't, I mean, it's not advantageous, it's more advantageous to no, fake data. No, it's using so synthetic data in this case is extremely smart. They can create as much data as they wish very cheaply, and it's labeled. So if you capture data when people are playing, you would still have to label it, which is of no use. Labeling is expensive. Labeled data is very expensive, unlabeled data is cheap.
And that's why Google relies on the neural networks. That's why we everyone's using auto encoders. Because they, you're trying to predict the input. If, if a model can predict the input, in other words, if I can look at this scene and close my eyes and predict it in my head, then I understand the scene. And that is the key to intelligence, I would say. Does deep learning mean auto-encoding? Pardon? Does deep learning mean auto-encoding? Are those synonymous? Deep learning means using several layers of neural nets, okay, so basically. That's okay. The, the latest speech recognition of Google, Microsoft, it's been on the news if you follow my Twitter or the Google group or whatever. You see, I've been posting several articles about this. It's pretty hard. The latest in speech recognition now uses um, deep learning, which is multi-layer neural networks. They're actually like, and then they're trained layer-wise, like you train an autoencoder, um, and then you do a fine, final refinement step, which is just a backpropagation algorithm, which you all pretty much know how to code. And that's Google's launch speech recognition. I personally think it's a lot better than Siri. And they've been quiet about it, but just because Google is smart as to how they launch things. Uh, just wondering if there's a place, one place. I hope Apple's not watching this, but yeah. <laughs> <they're> <laughs> nice. and, the, and the Apple map sucks too. Is there, <laughs> is there one place that you can get all the algorithms that are currently going on in machine learning? Is there one place where you could look at all the algorithms that are involved in current machine learning practice? Uh, yeah, there's two conferences. That's the latest, greatest in machine learning. And of course, you can build this for people, but you can also build this for other things. So if you want to create interfaces of, for robots to interact with humans, I think one of the big technology that will be developed in the future, especially as our population gets old and there's not enough young people to look after us and eventually, um, I don't know to what extent people will deal with border control, etc., etc., and what the politics will be, but we likely will need robots to look after us as we get old. Maybe not me, but certainly you. Um, so, it's good that we're developing this technology. So that brings me to the end of the course. I just want to ask you to do some evaluations for the TAs. This is, this is important because they help us improve the course over the, over the time. I want to thank you for a great class. And every class I end by saying this. You didn't know any machine learning when you came in here. Now you know machine learning. Now you know how to take people's data and do something with people's data. Make sure that when you do that, that you think about doing the right ethical thing. Um, just like you can classify whether a patient is good, is likely to have cancer or not, so that you help that patient, you can also do the same, use the same data and the same classifier to decide whether that patient will get insurance or not. So think about that. Thank you.